Nebraska finished its second season by going up against Doan one last time. Motivated by their loss to Iowa and becoming better trained by Coach Lyman, the Bug Eaters defeated Doan by 32-0. The standout player in the final Doan game was a young freshman halfback named George Flippin, the first black football player on the Nebraska team. Flippin ran with the ball for three touchdowns in the game and would soon become a star player in the following seasons. Uh, George Flippin is a great story. I mean, partly because where did he come from? I mean, this is just, this, the, you know, they weren't recruiting anybody in those days. It was whoever happened to go to the university and happened to show up and, you know, turn out for practice and, and, and prove to be a decent player. George Flippin was a natural because he was an athlete. He held a couple of school records in track. He had won championships as a heavyweight wrestler. He was the biggest guy on the team, and he was African-American. He was the first black football player in the Midwest, one of the first three in the country. And it kind of went mostly unnoticed because, again, Nebraska has some anonymity in its area that it was, it was way out in the boondocks and the plains that nobody paid attention to. Of course, there was controversy with some folks, but it never seemed to have affected Nebraska and their players. At the end of the 1891 football season, a new Western Interstate University Football Association was formed, consisting of the universities of Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska. But as the 1892 season was about to begin, coaching continued to be a problem for the fledgling Nebraska football team. J.S. Williams replaced W.P. Bowen as the official coach, but Williams was frequently absent from his duties, and when he was present, failed to make an impact on the team. With scarlet and cream chosen as Nebraska's official school colors, the 1892 season began against a new opponent, the University of Illinois, another well-established college league football team that had won their state championship for the last five years. What hope would the Nebraska boys have against such a team that was even more powerful than Iowa? On October 24th, our football boys scored their first victory. And indeed, it was a victory, for we played a team that had held the state championship of Illinois for five successive years. But when they struck the rattlesnake boys of Nebraska, they were severely beaten. At three o'clock, the pigskin was started from the center with the regulation V, and 15 yards were made before it was downed in an exciting contest of wills. Flippin scored the only touchdown of the game, and the final score was Nebraska six, Illinois zero. Nebraska had surprised everyone by conquering a foe no one thought could be beat. However, as the two teams were about to leave the field, an act of violence occurred. After the Nebraska-Illinois game, but before the lines had broken, formed as they were for a scrimmage, Huff, the heavyweight of the Illinois team, struck A.B. Jones of the Nebraska team, a terrible blow in the face, knocking him flat and bringing the blood freely. The slugger then turned on his heel and laughingly walked away. As soon as the fact became known, great indignation was felt, and if it had not been for the presence of the chancellor and several professors, violence would have been done to the perpetrator. This outburst of violence would be the beginning of many problems the Nebraska team would experience during the 1892 season, mostly because of its star player, George Flippin. This was the case for their next game, in which the Nebraska team traveled to Colorado to battle the Denver Athletic Club. After we'd been beaten, we were still treated royally by the Denver Athletic Club. The evening was to be spent at the theater. Through a false sense of patronage, the manager at the Opera House got the idea into his bigoted brain, devoid of gray matter, that the patrons would not like to see a Negro in the fashionable part of the Opera House. Of course, once Mr. Flippin was debarred from attending the play, the rest of our club, myself included, refused to attend the play. Mr. Flippin is a member of our team and a student of the university. This latter fact entitles him to all the rights and privileges enjoyed by any other student. Whatever he is not allowed to attend, no other member of our team will do either. The trouble of racism against George Flippin wasn't just limited to Denver. The following week, the Nebraska team traveled south to play the University of Missouri in the first contest between the two teams. Again, there was one problem, George Flippin. It is unconceivable to us that any of them bug-eating farmers up the river would allow some colored boy to play on their team. The thought of some Negro rubbing elbows with us educated white men, it's enough to turn the stomach of any decent human being. There is no way that Nebraska colored boy will be allowed to set foot on our playing field. If 
Nebraska can leave their Negro at home and we will take them on. If they refuse, then we will not play them on the field and damage our reputation and our code of honor. That a club from Missouri should object to playing our team because one member is colored is a significant fact. It denotes that there still exists in our Southern institutions remnants of that delusion which has so long boggled their minds. We are informed that no Negroes are admitted to the Missouri University. This is nothing more than race prejudice, influenced by secret sectional desire for revenge. Why do we find the anti-Negro sentiment so openly expressed by the Missouri football team? Those who play in their team now are only the sons of those who hated the Negro unto death. They believe what their fathers believed. If they do what their fathers did, they will have to be whipped as their fathers were whipped. Our team is truly representative, both of our principals and of our members. If the Missouri team refuses to come off from their bigoted perch, let them remain in the delightful companionship of the putty heads who are of their opinion. The game against Missouri was canceled, and Missouri's forfeit was recorded as a 1-0 victory for Nebraska. However, problems continued to plague the Nebraska football team during the remainder of the 1892 season. The Bug Eaters lost their next game against Kansas, and on Thanksgiving Day, the Nebraska team traveled to Omaha for the annual Iowa game. In Omaha, the Paxson Hotel was made our headquarters. There was the usual row over the admission of Flippin, the only colored member of our team. But we boys are bent on seeing the Civil Rights Bill is enforced, so far as hotels are concerned. And manfully, we stood up for our fellow teammate. The result was that the management yielded so far as to actually allow Flippin to eat and sleep in the hotel and pay for it. But a private dining room was given to all the boys, so the other guests might not know of the awful fact that a colored man was actually a guest at the hotel. Whatever discrimination George Flippin faced in Omaha, it didn't affect his performance on the field, and Flippin became the star player of the 1892 Nebraska-Iowa game. The struggle for supremacy between the Nebraska and Iowa State University teams wound up a tie after consuming nearly three hours, and the game is now a thing of the past. Never before were two more evenly matched, and the gains were made more often by the brilliant plays of individual members than by concentrated teamwork. Flippin was the star as usual, and he had the ball most of the time. He seemed never to grow tired, and whether he plays battering ram or sprinter, he gets the ball in the direction direction he wants it to go. Flippin carried off the laurels of the day, and at the conclusion of the game, if he had wanted the town, all he would have had to do would have been to ask for it, and it would have been given him by his admirers. After leaving the university in the spring of 1895, Flippin attended medical school in Illinois. He really didn't graduate from UNL. He, um, took coursework there, and then went to the University of Illinois at Chicago and earned his medical degrees there. And then he came back to Nebraska and that his father helped him to set up a practice here in Stromsburg. So he didn't actually grow up here in Stromsburg. I don't think he was the first doctor here, but he was the first one to build a hospital, as I understand it. And it is on this property that the hospital was first built. He had a reputation of never turning anybody down. If somebody were asking for his help, no matter how far away they were, he was going to travel and do what he could to help them. There was reports that people would be told it was like $50 for a procedure, and he would offer to do it for 25, knowing that they couldn't afford the other ones. So it was a good trait to have. People respected him for that. Today, there are only a few people alive who remember being treated by Dr. George Flippen. One of these former patients is Stromsburg resident Stanton Moore. Well, I must have been about seven, eight years old. And uh, I was riding my brother's bike and I run into this pickup that had the lid down on the box and I damaged this leg. And uh, I stood up and I fell down. I damaged the nerves in this leg right in here. I made a little dent in it, as a matter of fact. So I crawled across the road and I was crawling in the ditch and he saw me from his window in the hospital. He came down and he wanted me to stand up and walk and wonder why I was crawling in the ditch. And I told him I was trying to hide from somebody. <laughs> he said, stand up. 
and I did, and I fell right down. He says, okay, tell me about it. So then I told him about it, and he was a big, strong guy. He was a loving guy. He picked me up, and he carried me, and he took me home to my parents' house and laid me on the kitchen table, and he told them to put hot packs, soda hot packs on my leg for an hour, and after that, to get me on a bicycle and follow me and drive it to Osceola and back, and if you do that, He'll be perfectly okay. If he don't, he'll have a bad leg all of his life. And we did just like he said, and that leg was just fine after I got through that. He was a good man. He was a kind man. He lovable man. Good looking man. And he was always willing to help and do things in a good way. And I can still see him driving down the gravel road in that car of his. <laughs> Dr. Flippin would become the first person in York County to own an automobile. And after he was denied service at a local cafe because of his skin color, Dr. Flippin became the first Nebraska black man to successfully argue a civil rights case in the Nebraska State Court. He went to an opera house with his colleagues, and when they were done, they went to a restaurant in the lower part of that building, downtown York, Rio Cafe, Gutenfelder was the owner, and they walked in, they were ordering sandwiches and coffee, and the waitress told him he would have to eat it in the kitchen. And he said, I don't eat in my own kitchen. <laughs> I'm not going to eat in a restaurant's kitchen. The state of Nebraska brought suit against Gutenfelder and the Rio Cafe um, on behalf of George Flippin. And many people say it's the first racial discrimination case. Whether it is or not, I don't know, but it was probably among the first at least. It went into county court, and George side won. George Flippin continued to live in Stromsburg until the time of his death in 1929. Even though many of that generation are gone, the story is still claimed to be the largest funeral that Stromsburg has ever seen. And Dr. George Flippin is the only black person buried at the Stromsburg Cemetery and in Polk County.